Dr. Jenny. Um, thank you all for attending our general psychiatry uh, grand rounds today. We're gonna be talking, we have a great cast of people that are gonna be talking about the management of psychiatric illness in context of heart transplantation. And as there is a lot to cover, I'm gonna keep the introductions brief. Um, several of the speakers are in our own department. Leslie Omery will kick us off. She's an assistant professor. She joined uh, our department here in 2013 where she served as the director of the Transplant Psychiatry Service and has really provided incredible leadership and clinical service for individuals who need solid organ transplants, liver, heart, lung, and such, has been working with living kidney donors as well. Um, she's also joined by Dr. Daniel Donis, who is a newer recruit to the department. Uh, the trainees in the audience recognize him as the assistant training director for the general psychiatry residency. Um, he also works in the transplant psychiatry service and particularly with the liaison with the heart transplant team. So playing a critical role there. And to round out the departmental representation on the talk today, uh, Dr. Peyton Leah is the current consult liaison fellow uh, who's done a lot of work with this case and this team in general. Um, I wanna give a special acknowledgement to our fourth panelist today, Dr. Kelly Schlendorf. Uh, she joined Vanderbilt in the cardiology division in 2012 and serves as medical director of the Dar adult heart transplant program. Um, and just very recently was promoted to section chief of heart failure and transplantation. Um, Dr. Schlendorf, really, I appreciate you joining us today. This is a lot of work for all the panelists, particularly for someone coming from outside uh, our department. So thank you all for presenting. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Omari. Thank you, Warren. And um, we really appreciate Dr. Hecker's inviting us to present this case conference. Um, I wanna thank everybody for attending our presentation today and a special welcome to members of the heart transplant team who um, are also joining us. I'm so grateful to my colleagues who are presenting with me today. Dr. Peyton Lee will present the case of a woman with bipolar disorder and advanced heart failure who needed a heart transplant. Dr. Kelly Schlendorf will provide an overview of heart transplant and review medical indications, the pre-transplant pre medical evaluation and post-transplant expectations. I will discuss the pre-transplant psychosocial evaluation and Dr. Daniel Donis will consider common peri and post-transplant psychiatric complications and how to manage them. We'll have some time at the end for questions. So Dr. Lee will start us off with the initial case presentation. All right, so TN is a 39-year-old female with bipolar one disorder, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and heart failure who was admitted to Vanderbilt for volume overload. She was being evaluated for heart transplant, and psychiatry was consulted to assist in, the, in this evaluation while she was inpatient. She had previously been evaluated for a heart transplant at an outside hospital, but was denied due to psychosocial concerns. During a social work evaluation at Vanderbilt, several concerns were identified, such as her lack of transportation, limited understanding of her medical situation, previous non-adherence with medication, inadequate social support, and severe psychiatric disorder. On evaluation, she endorsed a history of bipolar one disorder that was diagnosed at the age of 21 years old. She felt that she had been coping well with heart disease and her main concerns at the time were somnolence, low energy, and poor attention. She reported stable mood and denied any other symptoms consistent with depression or mania. Her last manic episode had occurred six months earlier and had been associated with paranoia and hallucinations. In the past, she had experienced numerous manic episodes characterized by insomnia, racing thoughts, paranoia, irritability, and mood lability, with these occurring about once per year. Um, she had had over eight psychiatric hospitalizations as a result of mania, and her last one had occurred at VPH several years prior where she was experiencing command auditory hallucinations telling her to stab her father-in-law. Past medication trials included Seroquel, Cyprexa, Safris, Risperdal, Geodon, Abilify, Latuda, Trazodone, and Hydroxyzine. And per old psychiatry notes, she had chronic problems with insomnia, irritability, and non-adherence to medications and recommendations. Next slide. So she was able to engage in a rational discussion about the indication for and then the risks and benefits of transplantation. Um, and she was felt to have the capacity to consent for this procedure. Uh, AMOCA had been completed uh, previously and her overall score was 19 out of 30. She identified her mother 
as her primary caregiver, and her mother agreed that she would be capable of performing these duties. And as early, earlier mentioned, there were significant concerns brought up about her past non-adherence with recommendations and missed appointments. She denied any current or previous drug abuse or substance use treatment. She was now living with her mother in a bordering state as she was divorced from her ex-husband. She had no children um, and had not been working for several years due to her health problems. She graduated high school and completed some college and had no prior legal history. And now we'll hear from Dr. Swindle. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Leslie and Daniel and others for the opportunity to be a part of today's Grand Rounds. As medical director of the Heart Transplant Program, I would just say that one of the things I'm grateful for each day is the really amazing multidisciplinary collaboration amongst our team. And really critical to the success of our program over many years has been the thoughtful effort and dedication from people like Leslie and Daniel and others, so thank you. Next slide, please. My goal over the next 10 minutes or so is to give you a sense of why heart transplantation is, is, is needed in the first place. I'll summarize the evaluation process that takes place when patients are referred to us for heart transplantation and give you a sense for how the wait list works. Say a few words about the average operative and perioperative courses, and then give you a little sense of what the long-term expectations and challenges are in the days, months, and years following heart transplantation. Next slide. So the reason that heart transplantation exists and is important is because heart disease exists. And as you probably know, is the leading cause of death for men, women, and people of most racial and ethnic groups across the United States, as shown in the map here, where you can appreciate that there's significant geographic variability. And I'll just call your attention to the deep red hues in and around the state of Tennessee. Next slide. Certainly not all death due to heart disease is due to heart failure, but as it turns out, many deaths due to heart disease are such that heart failure, which one can really think of as weakening of the heart muscle that occurs for one of any number of different reasons, has become not just a national epidemic, but also a global epidemic. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that approximately 6.2 million adults in the United States are currently living with heart failure. And of those 6.2 million, about 10% will have what we often refer to as advanced heart failure. Next slide, please. Which is the number one indication for heart transplantation. I think as today's case illustrates well, not all patients with advanced heart failure look like the gentleman shown in this slide, but a patient with advanced heart failure might look like this. These patients tend to have intolerable symptoms, things like shortness of breath with exertion and often at rest. They'll frequently tell us that just doing basic daily activities like showering and getting dressed can be a struggle for them. They tend to be hospitalized frequently with signs and symptoms of fluid overload. And the absent things like uh, heart transplantation, their therapeutic options are very limited, such that patients who are living with advanced heart failure and who are not candidates for transplant have very poor survival on the order of about 25% at one year and only about 10% at two years. Next slide. When patients are referred to our program for consideration of heart transplantation, our team is tasked with answering two broad but very important questions. The first is, is a patient's heart sick enough to warrant heart transplant? That is, have we exhausted all of the medical and device therapies that may allow us to either postpone transplant for that patient or to defer it altogether? And second, equally importantly, is the rest of the patient well enough to undergo a transplant and to have a good outcome? Next slide. I won't recite all of the things listed on this slide, but needless to say, when patients undergo an evaluation, there are many different tests that are involved. We see them at least once in the clinic and often more than once. Uh, they get a lot of blood work drawn. Every patient has an echocardiogram to look at the heart structure and function, at least one heart catheterization. They'll undergo pulmonary function tests to look at lung function and also, of course, age-appropriate cancer screening. Next slide. And in addition to all of these tests, patients will meet with experts from a number of different disciplines, including all of the people listed here. Uh, importantly, transplant psychiatry is on that list. Next slide. At the end of that evaluation, we all meet together, uh, used to be in person and now it's virtual for obvious reasons, and we review the medical data and everybody who's had an opportunity to meet with the patient has a chance to weigh in. And at the end of that discussion, the, the decision that we're making is to list or not to list that patient for heart transplantation. And I'll tell you that of all of the meetings and professional activities that I participate in each week, it's really these meetings which I find to be the most intellectually and emotionally compelling and also truthfully the most humbling 
because I think it's it's not hyperbole to say that in many cases we are making decisions at these meetings that will significantly impact the likelihood that that patient will survive. Uh, and, and I would add that I think for me, the toughest decisions are those that involve turning a patient down for heart transplant waitlisting based on psychosocial factors. It's a little bit easier to decline a patient where we've diagnosed lung cancer or, or cirrhosis or very poorly controlled diabetes, things that are very clearly going to have a, an impact uh, on, on a bad outcome after transplant. But it can be tougher in cases where the decision rests on inadequate caregiver support or limited finances or in the case of the patient we're discussing today, mental health issues. Next slide. The transplant waitlist is electronic and is overseen by the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, which operates under contract with and oversight by the US government. The workings of the waitlist are complex and are outside the scope of today's discussion, but what I'll tell you is that how long a patient spends on the waitlist is generally a function of several different factors, including the things listed here. In the current iteration of the heart transplant waitlist status system, there are six active statuses uh, in such a way that a higher status is granted to those patients who are deemed to have a higher risk of waitlist mortality. And so by way of example, a patient who is listed as status one is sick enough to be in our ICU and is generally supported with some form of cardiopulmonary bypass, something like VA ECMO, whereas a patient who is status six has an advanced heart failure and is certainly sick enough to be listed, but is often at home waiting on a phone call. Blood type matters because in solid organ transplantation, uh, you can only accept an organ from a donor who has an immunologically compatible blood type with your intended recipient, or you risk hyperacute rejection where the new organ just doesn't work. Height and weight of the intended recipient matter uh, because we think in heart transplantation, undersizing the donor heart can lead to problems. And so for that reason, a six foot three waitlist candidate is likely to wait longer than somebody who is five foot, five foot four and of a normal weight. And perhaps most importantly, the center at which a patient is listed for transplant can have a big impact on his or her waitlist times. Next slide, please. Uh, there are currently about 140 adult heart transplant centers across the United States. And as you can appreciate here, most of these centers will perform an average of about 10 to 35 heart transplants a year and only a very small handful will perform upwards of 50 heart transplants per year. Uh, and importantly, and I think in, ex in an exciting way, next slide please, Vanderbilt is at the very far right end of this curve. Next slide. Uh, this graph shows the trend in our transplant volumes over the past few years, and you can appreciate that our, that our program has grown a lot. There are a lot of different reasons for that. Um, I think critical has been, has been the multidisciplinary team effort that I described earlier. In both 2020 and in the last calendar year, 2021, we performed 125 transplants per year. And this makes us the largest volume heart transplant program in the country for two years running. We currently follow upwards of about 550 patients in our post-transplant clinics. We have about 20 to 30 patients who are actively undergoing evaluation for transplant at any given time, and another 20 to 30 who are actively on the wait list at any given time. Next slide. Uh, to be clear, I am not a transplant surgeon, but I have spent time in the OR during a heart transplantation. And as you might imagine, it's pretty wild to see a patient's chest opened with the sternal retractors uh, and to see this huge cavity that exists once their own native heart has been removed and before the new heart is sewn in. What my surgical colleagues often tell me is that sewing in the new heart is actually relatively straightforward as cardiac surgeries go, but what can, also, what can often be more difficult is getting the old heart out. And that's especially true in patients who've had mild, multiple prior cardiac surgeries and who have lots of scar tissue, uh, including those with adult congenital heart disease for whom vascular reconstruction may be necessary. The transplant surgery itself takes anywhere from about 48 hours, sometimes longer. During this time, patients are supported with cardiopulmonary bypass and have variable amounts of blood product resuscitation. And it's during this surgery that we initiate very heavy doses of immunosuppression, including high dose steroids and other drugs that these patients will remain on lifelong in order to prevent rejection of the transplanted organ. Next slide. After a patient uh, returns from the OR, they go to the ICU where our median length of stay is about eight days. We try to get patients off the ventilator within, within about 12 to 24 hours and ideally out of bed and on their feet within one to two days. After patients leave the ICU, they go to our step-down unit where the median length of stay is about two weeks. And during this time period, the main focus is on medication titration and rehabilitation and transplant education. 
And then during the first month after transplant, there are lots of potential complications that, that we look out for. Um, and, and I've listed some of the major ones here. Graft dysfunction describes a scenario where for one reason or another, the new organ just doesn't work as we expect that it should. And in the first 30 days after transplant, graft dysfunction is the number one cause of mortality. Other common complications include bleeding, kidney failure, infection, and delirium. And as you might imagine, none of these complications are mutually exclusive, and it's often the case that one leads to another. So a patient who has bleeding complications in the OR is more likely to have graft dysfunction. That in turn can lead to renal failure, put patients at high risk for infection, and of course, higher risk for delirium, debilitation, and malnutrition. Next slide. I often think of heart transplantation as trading one disease process for another because, well, it's true that after a heart transplant, patients are no longer living with end-stage heart failure, which is a good thing. They're now facing a lifetime of immunosuppression and a very heavy pill burden and all of the many potential complications that come with it. And so I've listed some of those complications here. I think there's a common misconception in the transplant world that rejection is the number one thing that we as providers are concerned about. And it's true that we do worry about rejection, particularly during the first year after transplant. Uh, and so we surveil for it relatively frequently with endomyocardial biopsies, where we take a small piece of heart tissue and look at it under the microscope. But the truth is that in the contemporary era, rejection is actually relatively infrequent, so long as patients are adequately taking their immunosuppression as instructed, and so long as we as providers are adequately dosing their immunosuppression. Infection is a complication that uh, patients after transplant are at risk for throughout their lifetime. Chronic kidney disease is something that occurs frequently. This is unfortunately uh, a complication that is in part due to the immunosuppression that we use, which is nephrotoxic. Coronary allograft vasculopathy describes a condition that one can think of as an accelerated form of atherosclerosis in the transplanted heart that can occur sometimes as early as a year after transplant. And believe it or not, is often a reason that we will retransplant patients. It's really the only reason that we'll retransplant patients. And then finally, due in large part to their, uh, to their need for long-term immunosuppression, malignancy is common as well. Many of our patients suffer with skin cancers, but also with other cancers too. And so as it turns out, beyond about three years after a heart transplantation, both vasculopathy and malignancy combined are the number one causes of both morbidity and mortality. Um, and so I'll just conclude my portion by saying that, well, heart transplantation has been and continues to be the gold standard for patients who are living with end-stage heart failure. It's by no means a walk in the park. Uh, as you can imagine, even somebody with, with no mental health history may, may have a difficult time during heart transplantation. And for patients like the ones we're discussing today, who does have a mental health history, uh, transplant can, can be an even larger struggle. And so um, I think it speaks to the, to the important need and critical role that our transplant psychiatry colleagues play. And with that, I will turn things over to Leslie Omer. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was great. Um, okay. So life-saving heart transplant is available to a limited number of patients due to being such a scarce resource. Thus, as we've just heard, potential candidates are thoroughly assessed for both medical and psychosocial appropriateness. The pre-transplant psychosocial assessment is completed by a team from social work and psychiatry. Other transplant team members contribute information as well. There's a great 2019 review article from Bowie and colleagues that was very helpful in planning this talk. That and other references can be found on some slides at the end of the presentation. The main goals of the psychosocial evaluation are to predict adherence with post-transplant medical care and maximize outcomes for patients, including longevity and quality of life. We seek to minimize morbidity and mortality by identifying potential risk factors for non-adherence and to provide recommendations to mitigate these risks. Life after transplant requires significant effort on the part of the patient and their family. They are expected to take multiple medications, obtain lab tests and biopsies, attend follow-up appointments, monitor their weight, blood sugars, and blood pressure, and attend to a variety of other medical needs. Non-adherence to these issues can result in rejection, graft loss, and other medical complications, including death. Patients who present pre-transplant with a history of non-adherence are at particular risk, as past behavior can predict future behavior. These patients will require additional education, reminders, monitoring, and support. <clears throat> 
The psychological and social determinants of health, including psychopathology, substance abuse, cognitive status, social support, medical adherence, finances, housing, and health literacy are all vital issues to address in the psychosocial evaluation. These variables have been found to be associated with worst post-transplant outcomes, presumably due at least in part to inconsistent adherence with follow-up care. Social support is considered vital to post-transplant care. At our center, two caregivers, a primary and a secondary, are required to help patients with medication management, transportation to appointments, and other logical, uh, logistical and emotional support. The psychosocial evaluation is based on clinical interviews, as well as collateral information from medical records and family and friends. There are also several validated tools that can be used to help limit the subjectivity and possible unconscious bias of the evaluator. These include the PACT, which is the Psychosocial Assessment of Candidates for Transplantation, the TERS, which is the Transplant Evaluation Rating Scale, and the newest tool, which is the SIPAT, the Stanford Integrated Psychosocial Assessment for Transplantation. And we use the SIPAT here with both social work and psychiatry members contributing to the total rating score. Today, we will focus on three main areas, psychopathology, substance abuse, and cognitive functioning. Psychopathology is prevalent in patients with advanced heart failure, and when undiagnosed and untreated, can impair patients' ability to manage complex medical regimens. Depression in heart failure patients is estimated at 21%, while anxiety is between 18 to 45%. Depression is a known risk factor and can increase the relative risk of mortality by up to 65% post-heart transplant. Post-traumatic stress disorder is found in about 17% of patients with heart transplant. This can be caused by ICU delirium, prolonged hospitalizations, critical and acute or acute medical episodes, including cardiac arrest and ICD shocks, among other causes. Less common psychiatric disorders include bipolar disorder, as in our case patient, and schizophrenia. And these may also be seen less often in pre-transplant patients. Possibly this is due to a reluctance by outside providers to refer these patients for transplant evaluation. A recent study by Kaufman and colleagues looked at these disorders in the transplant population and identified that non-adherence was higher in patients who are unhoused, had positive psychotic symptoms, and had less than one year free of psychotic symptoms prior to transplant. This study also suggested that non-adherence was higher among patients with schizophrenia compared to those with bipolar disorder. As we all know, patients with personality disorders can be particularly challenging. And this is also true in the heart transplant population. As many as 15% of transplant patients are estimated to have personality disorders. Personality traits that are especially concerning include splitting of healthcare teams, dependence, and acting out such as suicidality, self-harm, and hostility. Personality disorders have been found to be strongly associated with non-adherence, with one study noting that all patients with severe personality disorders were non-adherent. Poor coping skills can also lead to intolerance of various, sim various symptoms and can lower quality of life in these patients. Of note, patients with well-controlled psychiatric disorders and strong social support may have similar outcomes post-transplant as patients without such disorders. This demonstrates the importance of early identification and treatment to support patients in their quest for heart transplant, as well as post-transplant care. Mental health treatment for patients with personality disorders should include psychotherapy. For patients with bipolar disorder or psychotic disorders, psychiatric treatment with medications is indicated. Patients with depression or anxiety should be treated with medications and or psychotherapy. Alcohol and other substances of abuse have been associated with worse outcomes following heart transplant. One study found more than a threefold increased risk of death in those who were abusing substances post-transplant. Active substance abuse is generally a contraindication for heart transplant. Many of these patients may be appropriate for a left ventricular assist device placement in order to allow more time to obtain abstinence and engage in treatment for their substance abuse. Alcohol use can cause dilated cardiomyopathy, and it is estimated that 9% of patients on wait lists for heart or lung transplant use unsafe amounts of alcohol. 
Alcohol abuse post-transplant can cause non-adherence, worsening of psychiatric symptoms, and lower quality of life. Pre-transplant factors associated with post-transplant alcohol relapse include lack of social support, family history, and less than six months of abstinence. Tobacco use significantly increases risks of medical comorbidities and death in patients with heart transplant. Despite this, unfortunately, 11 to 40% of patients will continu continue or return to smoking post-transplant. Methamphetamine is a stimulant that is widely abused, particularly in our part of the country. This can cause dilated cardiomyopathy, which can be reversible with abstinence. Unfortunately, abstinence can be challenging and relapses are often frequent. Opioid abuse, both of illicit heroin and prescription narcotics, has been shown to cause negative outcomes post-transplant, including graft loss and death. Marijuana remains controversial in the transplant world, with studies finding both negative effects and no effects on post-transplant outcomes. Different states have different laws regarding medical marijuana and recreational use, and thus national guidelines remain ambivalent. Here, active marijuana use is considered a contraindication for transplant. Evaluation of substance use includes clinical assessments, tools such as the audit and biochemical testing. Urine drug screen is used to monitor for common illicit drug use, such as cannabis, opioids, and amphetamines. Phosphatidyl ethanol, or PETH, is a metabolite of ethanol that is present in serum for up to two to four weeks. This test is highly sensitive and specific for verifying abstinence from alcohol, and we've only been using this test for the last few years. Urine, nicotine, and cotinine screens are used to confirm abstinence from tobacco and nicotine products. Patients with recent or active history of substance use disorders are generally referred for treatment. This might include intensive outpatient programs, AA and NA, medication-assisted treatment with Suboxone, Methadone, or Naltrexone, and other counseling modalities. Cognitive impairment is common in patients with advanced heart failure. There are multiple potential contributors to this, including low cardiac output, medication, age, and other medical comorbidities, such as hypertension, diabetes, depression, and delirium. Health literacy and educational level are also determinants of cognitive functioning. Mapelli and colleagues found that 86% of pre-heart transplant patients had abnormal scores in at least one domain on neuropsychological testing, and 36% had abnormal scores in five or more domains. To investigate if cognition might improve if cardiac output improved, another study looked at MOCA scores pre and post LVAD and found only approximately a two-point increase in scores from 23 to 25. As cognitive impairment can lead to lower adherence and worse quality of life, it's important to identify any irreversible causes such as stroke, intellectual disabilities, or dementia. Tools such as the MOCA, neuropsych testing, brain imaging, labs, and collateral information are helpful in evaluating cognition. Patients with significant cognitive impairment may still be safely transplanted with strong caregiver support who can help overcome the risks. In summary, the psychosocial evaluation is a real important part of this pre-transplant assessment and aims to identify risk factors for non-adherence and other negative outcomes and propose treatment recommendations to mitigate these risks. The transplant psychiatry team is integrated into the heart transplant team, and we work collaboratively to care for the whole patient. Regarding our patient, Tien, there was concern about her extensive history of bipolar disorder with frequent hospitalizations and episodes of decompensation, a history of inconsistent adherence, cognitive impairment, and limited social support with mainly only her mother available to help. She was discussed at the selection committee and deferred for one year in order to consistently engage in mental health treatment, achieve psychiatric stability, and improve adherence. Dr. Lee will now continue with the patient case. Thank you. So following the selection committee's decision, changes were made to her psychiatric medications while she was inpatient. Um, Trileptal was discontinued and she was started on Risperdal. She then followed up with her previous outpatient psychiatrist when she returned home. On one year follow-up, uh, with the transplant psychiatry team, she reported stable mood with no manic episodes, depression, psychosis, or psychiatric hospitalization. 
the previously identified risks were felt to have uh, been adequately addressed. So she was listed for transplant and received this about a month later. In the days following transplant, she developed delirium uh, that was associated with confusion, disorientation, agitation, insomnia, and visual hallucination. Risperdal was increased to prevent mania and psychosis while she was on high dose steroids. And she was also started on trazodone for insomnia and PRN Haldol for agitation. Her delirium slowly improved over the course of several weeks and she was eventually discharged. Over the course of three months following heart transplant, she was readmitted to Vanderbilt four more times for delirium. Each time, delirium was felt to be the result of a combination of, of several things, those being acute kidney injury, hypoxia, and sedating medication. Her delirium slowly improved over the course of these hospitalizations, and there were minimal changes made to her psychiatric medication. After transplant, she lived in Nashville for a year in order to have close follow-up plant specialists. She regularly followed up with transplant psychiatry, with whom she had appointments every several weeks. Most of her complaints throughout this time centered around anxiety, insomnia, and depression. In addition to risperdal and trazodone, she was started on melatonin and then lamictal to target some of these symptoms. Almost one year after transplant, she acutely developed racing thoughts, insomnia, psychomotor agitation, anxious rumination, and passive SI. She was admitted to VPH, where she was diagnosed as being in a mixed episode, and she stayed for a little over a week, um, where her medications on discharge were changed to Abilify, Depakote, and Remeron. And now we'll hear from Dr. Donald. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Heckers and Dr. Taylor uh, for inviting us to participate in uh, Grand Rounds today. And then again, a special thank you to Dr. Schlendorf and all the members of the heart transplant team are here, uh, both Dr. Schlendorf for joining us and uh, presenting on behalf of our patient, but then also for the heart transplant team, because I think that this case specifically um, is um, a really important case for the program in general, given all the risk factors that she had from a mental health standpoint, that we were all able to collaboratively to get her to transplant. Um, so thank you all for her care and, and joining today. Uh, Leslie, next slide. Um, so what I would like to talk about here is uh, the post-transplant experience. Um, I've divided this into three time periods, uh, the immediate time period. So this is the days and hours post-transplant, the early transplant period. So this is within six months, um, and then the late transplant period beyond after six months and beyond. And I'm going to talk about themes uh, that are common for us to see as psychiatrists in these areas specifically to our patient here, but then just generally as well, because I think a lot of the themes that come up for the patient that we're presenting today are common in many of our patients who undergo transplant. For the immediate transplant period, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the existential and psychological experiences that a patient experiences. We're gonna talk about delirium, which is common post-transplant as noted earlier, and then the effect of steroids on a patient's experience right after transplant. For the early period, we're gonna talk about how someone's experience and perspectives shifts from just undergoing a transplant to the weeks and months in the hospital and then returning home. We're gonna talk a little bit about the in various somatic experiences that people have, whether that's insomnia, fatigue, or pain. And then in the late transplant period or post-transplant period, we're gonna talk about mood symptoms, the settling perspectives they have on their life and their identity, and then cognitive functions longer term. Next slide. So I think one of the most important things that I kind of want to highlight in my portion of the talk here is the transformation that occurs in someone's perspectives about their life, uh, about their health and being ill. Prior to transplant, patients often view their life, their illness um, in ways of feeling like loss of control, feeling isolated, feeling like they're, the way that they live normally is no longer the case because of the severity of their heart failure. And being listed for a heart transplant gives them a significant amount of um, potential hope um, that this will be reversed, that they can go back to how life was normally. In the immediate period post-transplant, I'm talking about like hours and a couple of days right after transplant, there's um, in some ways a, a extraordinary transformation that occurs for a patient where they go from having this severe debilitating illness facing death to all of a sudden a new lease on life, feelings of rebirth. And our patients specifically, she often talked about 
um, salvation in the context of um, her uh, religious and spiritual beliefs. There's also a renewed sense of hope in this immediate post-transplant period. And we're gonna talk about how this kind of evolves over the course of days and weeks um, as they enter into the long-term uh, treatments in a post-transplant context. Next slide. Immediately post-transplant, one of the biggest things we're concerned about is delirium as talked about earlier. Um, the exact rates in a heart transplant, uh, post-heart transplant patient is not exactly known. Uh, estimated rates of 75% are gathered from retrospective data and patient reports. Um, if you look at studies looking at post-cardiac surgery, the incidence of delirium is, appears to be close to 54%. Uh, this may apply to the transplant population, and I wonder if that actually might be higher for the transplant population, for reasons we'll talk about here in a minute. The reason delirium is so important and so critical in the post-transplant period immediately after the surgery Things like delusions and hallucinations that are common in delirium, things like paranoid thoughts and hypoactivity, all impact things that are very critical for the recovery of a patient post-transplant. So accidental injury, a sternotomy is a very um, challenging, uh, or it, it's a kind of a, as you can imagine, a, a serious uh, wound that is created. And it's a very vulnerable period right after a transplant that that wound can be further damaged. So delirium causing delusion, delusions and hallucinations that lead to agitation um, creates a very precarious situation for a patient who might re-injure a wound after a surgery. Paranoid thoughts about the team, about what's going on in the hospital can lead to decreased adherence to the very critical treatments that need to occur post-transplant, especially in the immediate period. And then hypoactive activity in general in delirium decreases the ability for the patient to engage in rehab or engage in nutrition, both of these which are very critical for a patient recovering immediately after a transplant surgery. Next slide. I think it's a little bit beyond the scope to kind of itemize all of the causes of delirium post-transplant, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things here. The first is the general approach to evaluating delirium in a patient post-transplant. I would argue this is how we might approach the evaluation of delirium in all patients, but specifically for a patient who's gone through transplant. I think about what are the predisposing factors, so the things that um, exist in a patient that we may not necessarily be able to change that increase the vulnerability that the patient will experience delirium. What are the potential inciting factors? So what are the things about the surgery itself and about the treatments around that that kind of trigger the existence of delirium? And then what are the perpetuating factors? What are the things that after a transplant surgery perpetuate delirium in an ongoing fashion, even if the inciting thing has gone away. For the patient undergoing transplant, I think the, one of the most important things to consider is many patients who have severe heart disease exist in a state of chronic brain hypoperfusion as a result of their uh, heart failure. There's often evidence of vascular disease in their brain. Um, they're often older in population. They often have metabolic dysfunction as a result of other end organ damage as a result of heart failure. And many times they need sedating medications around the times right before transplant. These are all kind of predisposing factors that make our patients more vulnerable for delirium. And again, without going through all the kind of exhaustive list of the things that can occur post-transplant, uh, because many of them are common for other reasons that patients get delirious in the hospital. The thing I really want to kind of highlight is uh, medita medication toxicity, which we'll talk about on the next slide here. Um, and that hyper hypoperfusion can persist immediately after transplant. Um, so the brain's ability to kind of receive the nutrients, blood, um, oxygen, things like that, that it needs to function properly can persist even immediately post-transplant. Finally, perpetuating factors. So, uh, it's very common, not just in patients undergoing transplant, but any other type of major surgery um, to have disruptions in their sleep-wake cycle. Again, on many sedating medications, there's a prolonged period of immobility and the chance for repeat effect infections. Next slide. So just a quick note here on um, the immunosuppressant neurotoxicity, which is hypothesized to be a source of delirium and longer-term cognitive effects uh, or deficits in patients un undergoing transplant. Not all immunosuppressants um, are shown to cause neurotoxicity, but there are a couple here. Uh, this class of immunosuppressants, the calcineurin inhibitors, which includes tacrolimus and cyclosporin, are commonly used in our patients undergoing transplant. And there is evidence to suggest that in the long term they do have some neurotoxicity. I think the interesting thing about this class of drugs is that 
they themselves do not cross the blood-brain barrier, but they can induce apoptosis, or at least it's hypothesized that they can induce apoptosis in the brain capillary endothelial cells. This increases their, in, their permeability. And with that increased permeability, both you can have more inflammation entering into the brain, but also there's hypothesis that the calcineurin inhibitors can cause apoptosis selectively to um, glial cells in the brain, which can further cause uh, neurotoxicity and is, again, hypothesized to be a cause of delirium cognitive dysfunction. So I think that that's interesting. The other aspect of this that's hypothesized is the effect that calcineurin inhibitors might have on the endothelial increases the vulnerability of experiencing delirium from other reasons that um, the brain blood-brain barrier would normally protect someone from. Next slide. And again, I don't think I have the time to go through all of the um, ways that we would prevent or reverse delirium, but just to make a point here that um, there are various non-pharmacologic things that are really important in preventing delirium. The ABCDEF bundle, which was developed here at Vanderbilt, is a very critical um, intervention that we can do in the ICU to prevent delirium. Next slide. A note here on uh, steroids and uh, the effects, the neuropsychiatric effects long-term. So patients post-transplant, particularly in the immediate period, receive very high doses of corticosteroids. And it's thought often, or at least what's often discussed about steroids in the psychiatric context is ideas about steroid-induced mania and steroid-induced psychosis. What I really want to emphasize here is that psychosis and mania is not the only thing that patients experience. For our patients specifically, who had a very clear history of bipolar disorder, we were concerned about that risk. But generally speaking, the vast majority of patients that I work with who experience, who go through transplant, experience some degree of neuropsychiatric effects from steroids. This ranges from initial euphoria, which can combine uh, kind of in a really intense way, both with the effect the steroid has of going through transplant, but also just the, the, the impact that this has in their life to all of a sudden be dying from heart failure and to have this transplant. Irritability, anxiety, behavioral things like pacing, increased motor activity, tremor, impulsivity. Uh, these are all very, very common, I think, in our patients because of the high doses of the steroids they receive immediately. And I also think, interestingly, as the dose of steroids is tapered in the long term for patients, I find that they sometimes notice a, um, a depressive effect. So they are coming down from the steroids and they notice they feel kind of sadder or more withdrawn. Um, and that sometimes I think is, a, is an often overlooked side effect of receiving high dose steroids is the, is the coming down from the high doses that they, they, uh, they experience. Next slide. Um, so we talked about the immediate period. I wanna talk briefly here about the early period. So this is oftentimes patients towards the end of their admission or in um, when they've returned home. Next slide. The most important transition here is the coming down from the euphoria of just going through a transplant. The early recognition that life is not going back to normal the way it was before. Um, there's continued need for tests. There's continued need for medications. Um, there may or may not be a reconnection with family members. Oftentimes patients pre-transplant spend many uh, weeks and months in the hospital. And there's an expectation as soon as they go through transplant, they will be able to reconnect. Sometimes they're not able to do that. So this can, next slide, please. This can be often a, a period of disillusionment, a, an idea, a reframing of things as I thought that this was gonna be an event that reversed everything. And I'm starting to realize that this is a process. It's not a rebirth. It's a milestone in a long process of my life. Things are not going back to normal. I'm still sick. Uh, my admission is going longer than I thought it would. We often try, oftentimes try to prepare patients for the impact this is gonna have on their life but I think that in reality, there's no way to really fully grasp what it's like to be struggling with the things that people struggle with post-transplant. There's no way to kind of really fully like embrace and prepare for that uh, transplant. There's also this thing that happens with guilt. Patients struggle with the concept of benefiting from another person's death. They struggle with this idea that they have now this perceived debt that they have no way of paying back. There's feelings of survivor's guilt. So hearing about their community of other people who are listed for transplant that they often connect with and understanding that many of them don't survive to undergo the transplant. There's also, I think, an interesting body of literature and discussion about characteristics of the donor that the patients then embrace themselves. Sometimes they feel connected in some way to the people or to the donors of the organ that they've received. 
And interestingly, family members and friends will also comment and note changes in their personality and people wonder about the connection to their donor. I find that to be very interesting about the connection. I think that just kind of highlights some of the existential things that people are thinking about post-transplant that they may not have thought about prepared for. And certainly a psychiatrist, you know, before I started doing work like this, I never really thought about patients would be experiencing. Next slide, please. Combined with this change in perspective that happens early, patients are still very much struggling with a lot of somatic things, difficulty sleeping, fatigue. For our patient we're talking about here, fatigue, pain, and insomnia were one of the hardest things that she struggled with. And again, thinking about the predisposing, precipitating, perpetuating factors of insomnia is a really important approach to evaluating insomnia. Next slide, please. Just a quick note on the things that we normally do to address difficulty sleeping in patients undergoing or who've gone through transplant. I would say that this is probably no different than our standard approach. I try to emphasize a little bit more on sleep hygiene improvements and CBTI, oftentimes because these patients are on a lot of different medications already. However, the reality is, is that many times we need to use medicines to help patients to at least initiate sleep while they work on some of the other sleep hygiene things. I made an asterisk here on atypical antipsychotics just to note that while it's commonly used acutely for treatment of insomnia, this can be particularly challenging in our patients who are trying to minimize weight gain and other metabolic disturbances so that they can continue to recover post-transplant. Next slide. We'll skip this for now in the interest of time just to say that after a patient, after a transplant, patients are very tired. <laughs> so, and it's hard to do this. Next slide. Okay, finally, the post-transplant experience greater than six months. Next slide. Oh, my, okay, good. My computer almost died here. Um, the transformation psychologically for a patient kind of usually starts to kick in, I find, greater than six months. They start to settle into this sense of like, this is the new normal, and there's acceptance or reject rejection around that. There's a focus on continued need for adherence to treatment. There's new fears and new challenges, the challenge of concern about rejection. Uh, the nature of their relationships has sometimes changed. So for our patient, her connection with her mother um, continued to be close, but I think some of the nuances of that change where her mother provides more of a caregiver role now than mother and friend, and patients struggle sometimes with the, the kind of fluctuating nature of these relationships. But most importantly, I think that patients start to begin to identify as a transplant survivor. They start to view, and I, I like the kind of the way you framed this earlier, Dr. Schellendorf, being post-transplant in of itself is almost like a chronic illness. There are things that you need to do to maintain that. There are things that you need to, medications, behaviors, diet, things like that. And, and in some ways, being post-transplant is like a disease entity in of itself. Next slide. Depression is one of the things we're most concerned in the later times post-transplant. Um, as Dr. Omri mentioned in a, in a few of her slides, uh, things like decreased physical activity, treatment adherence, weight gain, increased association, poor health behaviors like alcohol and tobacco, all of these are dangerous in a patient who's depressed, extraordinarily more dangerous in a patient who's gone through a transplant because stopping medications for a few days or weeks can be lethal for them. And so we tried to be very proactive about treating depression in our patients post-transplant because of the risk that depression plays um, in morbidity and mortality in this group. Next slide. Just a couple of comments on mania and psychosis. Um, I think the reality for this is that not enough patients who have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia really have been transplanted. So we don't really know that much about some of the longer term outcomes in this group of patients. Um, I think the pearls clinically to be shared here, one is that the steroids are high dose at the beginning. If a patient has a risk factor for mania or psychosis down the road post-transplant, there are chance instances in which steroids be, would be increased again for rejection. And so psychiatrists should be mindful of the fact that their patients who've gone through transplant might experience some amount of rejection where their steroids are increased. And we should be mindful about whether or not new manic psychotic symptoms occur later down the road, not just around the time of transplant. We avoid lithium because of the uh, renal toxicity associated with immunosuppressants and then carbamazepine because of the metabolic uh, effects that definitely will impact immunosuppressants. Next slide. And then finally, I just wanted to make a couple of comments about cognitive function long-term. So interestingly enough, um, a large percentage, around 86% is estimated of patients pre-cardiac transplant have some degree of cognitive dysfunction. There are many, many different reasons for that. And I don't have time here to kind of go through the exhaustive list, 
most likely a large percentage of that is due to systemic um, hypoperfusion and how that affects the, nerve, the central nervous system chronically. I have a little bit of a wonder about some of the studies that have looked at this and about the, you know, whether or not this cognitive deficits are due to permanent changes or transient changes um, and or delirium, if that might be undiagnosed in the group of patients uh, who are studying in this. Nonetheless, um, there is evidence to suggest that cognitive function does improve after a transplant, and it's likely due to the fact that um, there's improvement in perfusion to the brain. However, long term, uh, cognitive function does slowly decline after. And again, this is thought to be due to some of the toxicity that might be due to immunosuppressants, corticosteroids long term, and then, of course, the recurrence of heart failure and rejection that will occur years down the road. Overall, however, I think the risk of this is not well studied, and um, this would be a great thing to look at down the road is what are the long-term cognitive effects uh, from transplant. And with that, Dr. Lee will resume talking about uh, the closure for our case. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so following discharge of ETH, our patient returned to outpatient care with the transplant psychiatry team. She continued to experience significant insomnia and was switched from Remeron to Trazodone. At her last appointment, her medications were then Abilify, Depakote, and Trazodone. Um, and her insomnia has improved significantly and mood has remained stable. And actually, as of a few weeks ago, she has moved back home and returned to the care of her previous outpatient psychiatrist. Fantastic. Uh, this Thanks. is this has been great. Um, I hope I didn't just didn't cut someone off when I said that. I, I just had like two sentences. <laughs> I was just going to thank everybody so much for joining us today, um, particularly the participants. Um, and I just wanted to comment that, um, you know, while there's only a few of us who actually work in the field of transplant psychiatry, there's so much to be learned uh, with collaborations with those outside our field. And kind of as Kelly had mentioned earlier, I encourage everyone to seek out these opportunities. I, I feel like uh, it, it's through these multidisciplinary partnerships that we can really make the best use of our individual skills and expertise to help our patients more holistically. So thank you all for joining us. I'm just gonna run through a couple of slides here at the end uh, with the references on them that you can look at later if you wish in the recording. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists again for uh, doing this. Um, I actually, before we get to the, there's a couple of questions in the chat and the Q and A, but before I get to that, I had a question about the kind of long-term cognitive outcomes, which you all did a nice job emphasizing. There's a lot of things that may contribute to that in the post-transplant individuals. Uh, frankly, how often do you see that's a problem? Uh, do you see people coming in saying, "My, you know, I'm post-transplant, my brain's not working, I can't remember things? Or is that not the biggest neuropsychiatric issue that may be cropping up? I can answer that and I'd be curious, Kelly, from your perspective too. I think it's pretty common. I think years down the road, I definitely, particularly in patients that we're seeing closer to the need for a reevaluation for transplant, they will notice that. Uh, I think, like I said earlier, there's so many variables that are going on to know like what is actually the cause. It's probably a lot of different things. Um, I think it is pretty common. The other thing it's sometimes hard to tease out is, are the cognitive changes, particularly like changes with memory, and attention, are these related to, are these independent or are these related to depression? Because I think depression is also so common and depression seems to kind of crop up in later years as patients are facing more threats of rejection and a need for a retransplant. Uh, it's also unclear, like, is it the depression that's starting to come up that's the result of the cognitive changes? Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'll be curious, Kelly, if, if you have any thoughts on that too. I would agree with everything you said. I think there's so many confounders that it can sometimes be hard to tell when somebody comes in complaining of brain fog or memory loss, what the cause might be. But we frequently hear from our patients, even those who are doing relatively well and not suffering from, from significant complications, that they feel like they've lost a little bit of memory or that they struggle a little bit with, with what they'll often refer to as brain fog. So I agree with Daniel's comments. Oh, thank you. One other little piece of that too that I wanted to, there's been a handful of patients that we've had who've had some form of cardiac arrest that's been substantial around the time of transplant. And I'm thinking of one patient specifically where there are definitely cognitive deficits ongoing, but we've not been able to on any type of imaging measure evidence of like a stroke. But I wonder if in the context of a transplant, 
the transient periods of hypoperfusion lead to cognitive deficits that are permanent but not progressive. So, so a lot to learn. Um, there's one question uh, in the chat uh, for a little bit more detail. Um, what is the etiology of the patient's heart failure? Do we know for this particular case? She had what we refer to as a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, so not a cardiomyopathy, not heart muscle disease as a result of coronary disease, which is commonly a cause of heart failure, but something unrelated. And I think we don't know the cause of her, of her heart failure. And unfortunately, in many cases, that tends to be the case. Um, in terms of what tends to lead to non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, genetic factors can frequently play a role. Sometimes we know the genetics involved, more oftentimes we don't. We sometimes think that a virus may have attacked the heart at some point in the distant past. As uh, Dr. Omri mentioned previously, alcohol for people who have a very heavy history of alcohol use can be a factor. And then there are other diseases like amyloid and sarcoid uh, that can play a role. But my recollection in this patient's case is that we didn't have a great understanding of the cause of her disease. She did have valvular disease associated with her heart failure and that almost certainly played some contributing role. Thank you. I, I don't see a lot of other questions in the chat. We have just two, literally just two minutes left. Uh, but I do see a lot of compliments from the chat about everyone. Thank you all for the excellent presentation. Um, again, I learned a lot. It's really nice to hear how you all doing to open up kind of an insight into uh, how this program runs. And I didn't realize Vanderbilt was so far ahead of other institutions in how we manage uh, cardiac transplant cases. So thank you all for the work you do and thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks everybody. Um, next week's talk uh, will be by Rachel Donnelly, uh, who's an assistant professor of sociology here at Vanderbilt. And the title of that talk will be Mental Health During the COVID-19 Pandemic, The Interplay of Individual Stressors and State Sociopolitical Contexts. So it looks like it would be interesting too, if you want to join us. Okay. And this will, the recording of this will be posted on the blog post later this afternoon. Thank you, Jenny.